Hello, this is Ralph Turchiano for another issue of the Health Research Report this November 1st, or 1 November 2012. And the first one I want to start out with, it comes down to basically testosterone. Now, the interesting thing about testosterone for the longest period of time when it came to prostate cancer is obviously they always said testosterone was a bad thing. Well, however, out of the October 29th, a couple days ago, American Society for Radiation Oncology's 54th annual meeting. They came out with a study titled, Drop in Testosterone Tied to Prostate Cancer Reoccurrence. What they discovered was this. The men who had a decrease in testosterone also appear to be the men most likely to see an increase in their PSA after treatment. Again, this had to do with more radiation than anything else. But, however, though, they noticed the correlation, which is surprising because, obviously, how many men have been treated with prostate cancer going with anti-androgen therapy? Meaning, they try to feminize these men because they believe testosterone is the culprit. Now, a series of studies started arising over the past four or five years that start showing that basically when testosterone levels are low, remember this is correlation, and they saw causation, that those men are more vulnerable for prostate cancer to return. Interesting as far as being counterintuitive, but I'm just curious to see exactly how long it takes industrialized medicine before they start changing their treatment paradigms. But I go on. All right, they said that seeing a drop of testosterone is tied to recurrence is a kind of a surprising result. Of course it is, because it's against the traditional dogma that people have drilled into their heads day in and day out. So, they even went as far as recommending potentially testosterone as a treatment preventing for prostate or PSA scores of prostate cancers from re reoccurring, which obviously is going to be a major surprise for a lot of men who had to endure everything from gynomastia to hot flashes and to who knows what else because their oncologist or urologist saw testosterone being the bad guy, regardless of what the observational studies were panning out. All right, just something to think about. And again, that was from the October 29th American Society of Radiation Oncology 54th meeting. Nothing I'm making up, just what's out there. All right, out of a wonderful headline called Scare Yourself Thin, and it don't mean with prostate cancer. An article out of the British Guardian came out with an interesting finding. Now, in combination with basically, or I should say, who funded the study was a place called Love Film. They noticed, obviously, anybody watching a horror movie breathes a little faster, the respiration goes a little bit more, the carbon dioxide, the heart rate all tends to increase. Well, they wanted to see exactly what that meant. And what they discovered was really interesting. That when you watch a horror movie, or a scary movie, so to say, something interesting occurs. All these little metabolic increases result in an increase in metabolism. How much? Well, let's break it down. They came up with a couple of different things. For extreme calorie burning, they recommend The Shining, which after a 90-minute viewing results in about 184 additional calories being burnt over what would happen if you're just sitting there doing nothing to begin with. For a little bit moderate level, they recommend watching Jaws, which resulted in 161 calories. And for a little bit less, just for a little bit more calm and not as many jumps and scares or increased respiration, The Exorcist, which resulted in 158 calories being burnt during a 90-minute showing. Pretty cool way as far as basically getting uh, a little extra metabolism and calorie burning out there. And a good way to get people to watch horror films that might not of uh, I would say might not have wanted to go see them anyways because they found no societal use for them because they inspire violence and all those other bad things. Well, at least now they inspire calorie burning. Let's see how long they hold to that opinion. All right. Now a more important one. What if I told you there was something out there? For, the, for basically out there that can harm people during pregnancy 
and also the newborn offspring of that individual. And it did this. It elevated the risk of miscarriage, preterm birth, neonatal health complications, and possibly newer behavioral abnormalities for the longer term, and even could cause autism. Now, if you had a friend or a relative that was pregnant or a significant other, you'd probably keep them away from this stuff in a 10-foot pole. Well, out of the October 31st Journal of Human Reproduction, and interesting, as a backup, they discovered that this was doing that when they were looking at in vitro fertilization. Why? Because those that were on this particular type of substance, we were having tremendously, uh, I should say, they were having a lot more miscarriages than those that were not. And so the observational point started to kick in and they wanted to confirm it with data. What is it? It is SSRIs. SSRIs being selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or otherwise known as your popular antidepressants, and also your number one prescribed drug in the United States at this current point. And the reason it may be surprising is because you remember it wasn't too long ago, I'd say like during the whole Tom Cruise thing going on, four or five years in the postnatal depression thing, that they were saying that there's no way that these drugs can bypass or pass the placental barrier and hurt, harm the infant. Well, let's see what the reproduction specialist said, or human reproduction specialist. Quote, elevated risk of miscarriage, preterm birth, neonatal health complications, possible longer neurobehavioral abnormalities, including autisms from the SSRIs. They said over the last 20 years, there's been a 400% increase in antidepressant use. And so they said this began to play a role, and they noticed in women who were pregnant or trying to get pregnant. All right, they noticed that the SSRIs were resulting in a decrease pregnancy rate for women going for fertility treatments. That was the point that triggered it. And also it consistently showed that women using antidepressants experienced increased risks of miscarriage. And we go on. The it basically said preterm birth, obviously. What they were concerned about with the antidepressants did also the SSRIs was the most pressing obstetrical compli complication besides speech. The author's right. In more than 30, 30 studies, the evidence overwhelmingly points to an increased risk of early delivery in women who are taking antidepressants. 30 studies. Not just one or two. We're not talking observational anymore. We're showing a causative effect. All right. They also suggest the data from the antidepressant usage, especially if it extends beyond the first trimester, led to an increased risk of basically pregnancy-induced hypertension and preeclampsia. Similarly, longer-term exposure to these SSRI antidepressants appear to correspond with an increased incidence of birth weight falling below not the 50th, not the 40th, not the 30th percentile, but the 10th percentile, which obviously means they're not fully developed, which resulted, of course, in respiratory problems and other issues. And this is where it gets even more intriguing. The 2006 study showed that infants exposed to antidepressants in utero had a 30% risk of newborn behavioral syndrome, which is associated with persistent crying, jitteriness, and difficulty feeding. In more rare instances, the syndrome can produce seizures and breathing difficulties leading to what's called intubation. So basically seizures on top of that. This is from something five years ago they said, oh, it doesn't pass the placental barrier. All right. Also two, the most intriguing part of this was a study from Kaiser Permanente, which said they saw a two-fold increase. Now keep in mind, SSRIs don't get fully metabolized or say broken down by your sewage treatment plants, your groundwater, everything. You see studies all the time about happy fish and fish being too uh, antidepressant uh, indoctrinated to even want to reproduce. You started seeing that three or four years ago, animals ended up with SSRIs in their system, the whole lineup. So keep that in mind. It's had a two-fold increase from Kaiser Permanente study in autism. 
spectrum disorders associated with maternal treatment with the SSRIs. And that was just during the first trimester Kaiser Permanente saw this. So what that means is those people taking antidepressants that want to get pregnant or planning on getting pregnant, by the time they find out that they're probably pregnant, the neurological damage has already been set in place, meaning the game is afoot. So, what does this state? It states this. If a person's planning on getting pregnant or in the process of getting pregnant, that basically anything else but SSRI should be considered with your doctor before going on this particular drug. So, psychotherapy, counseling, just about anything to improve mood is better than jeopardizing yourself and also the future of your offspring by basically experimenting with a known, well I should say, let's put it this way, doesn't help with basically your offspring or pregnancy in any way, shape, or form. Well, that's it. Hope you get something out of that. This first of November, 2012. And I'll catch you guys in a few days. There's the mouse.